All right, folks, thank you very much for joining us here today for our briefing with regard to what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus in Nebraska. As always, I want to remind folks that we are staying home, staying healthy, staying connected. We're on day 21 of our Stay Home, Stay Healthy, Stay Connected campaign. And of course, we want to remind everybody about our six rules to keep Nebraska healthy, starting with stay home, no non-essential trips outside the household. Work, work from home if you can. Work in a socially distanced way whenever possible at work. Three, shop, shop once a week. Don't take the entire family, have a list, be efficient, get in, get out. Four, help kids socially distance. Keep them at home to play. Avoid playgrounds and group sports. Five, help seniors socially distance. Maybe you can help somebody out in your neighborhood or at your local church so that that senior can stay home and you can run their errands for them. Maybe you can go shopping for them. But don't go visit them in a long-term care facility. And then six, exercise daily. Exercise at home or with a, an appropriate socially distanced type exercise. So those are our six rules to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected, keep Nebraska healthy, day 20 of 21. So continue to please remember that. Next, uh, we want to remind everybody about our testnebraska.com. So testnebraska.com is our program that's going to increase testing. We're roughly running between 1,000 and 1,200 tests a day. So we're going to ramp that up with an additional 3,000 tests. We're working on getting that lab set up right now. We want people to sign up. We've got 104,000 people that are signed up right now. Please go sign up on testnebraska.com. It will take you less than five minutes to do that. Uh, we'll then have that information from all across the state that will help us to be able to know where we should be dedicating testing resources. And that's how we're going to schedule people to come in and get tested so that we can do it in an efficient way. We'll send you a scheduled time to come in. You come in, we get you swabbed, you leave, we'll send you a follow-up email with what your test result was. So again, it's an important program to be able to expand testing here in Nebraska and get a bigger picture of what's going on in our state with regard to coronavirus. So please sign up. And then once you sign up, go challenge five of your friends to sign up with the hashtag Test Nebraska Challenge. We wanna make this go viral, fight the virus by going viral. And then also, it is in Spanish. TestNebraska.com slash ES, the homepage, the assessment, everything's in Spanish now. So if you uh, are in English, you want to flip it, there's a little box up in the upper right-hand corner. I suppose it would be that for the folks on the, for, from your perspective to be able to flip it from English to Spanish. So please sign up at TestNebraska.com. We have several upcoming holidays. We've got Cinco de Mayo coming up soon as well as Memorial Day. Now, recall that we've extended the 10-person rule through the month of May, and that means that no social gatherings larger than 10 people. And in fact, we encourage people, when you're doing these celebrations for Cinco de Mayo or Memorial Day, the best thing to do is just celebrate within your household, but please, no more than 10 people in any celebration. I know that's going to put kind of a damper on the, the holidays, but again, we are still trying to slow the spread of virus here in our state. While we are taking steps to loosen those restrictions, we are going to continue social distancing and all the other restrictions that we've got in place. So please keep that in mind as you're thinking about celebrations. Do not have that big celebration for Cinco de Mayo or for Memorial Day. Keep it low key and preferably within your household. Uh, DHM announcements. So we uh, have several uh, public health districts. So remember, we're going to do a separate directed health measure for each of the public health districts to be able to tailor our response to the geography of the state. And so we have three that we're gonna to announce today. It'll be Lincoln Lancaster, West Central, and Three Rivers. We'll all be going to a May 11th new DHM. So they're currently scheduled through the 6th. We're gonna extend their current DHM from the 6th through the 10th. So under the com completely the same restrictions they've been operating on for the last several weeks, weeks those three public health departments will, under, uh, under, will be operating under the same guidelines they had before from the 6th to the 10th. And on the 11th, that's when we'll have the looser restrictions that we've seen in places like Douglas, Sarpy, and Cass, and those other counties that we announced earlier as well. So but those will pick up May 11th. Now, I also need to apologize to Shannon uh, Vanderheiden in the West Central District. Yesterday, we got a question about 
May 31st, I said I didn't understand where that date came from. As we mentioned today, West Central is going to go to May 11th. Uh, Shannon, please accept my apologies. That was my bad. I was not aware that we gave you bad information with regards to that May 31st date. That was completely our fault in our organization, my fault for not knowing that. So please accept my apologies. Uh, and again, you're going to be good to go for May 11th, and that should make everybody, uh, especially in North Platte, happy. Okay, next. Um, a lot of our operations have been modified with regard to the coronavirus and how we're adapting to the social distancing and so forth. Uh, taking care of some of our most vulnerable Nebraskans through our Department of Development Disabilities is no different. And so we've had to change some of our operations and we've been given flexibility from the federal government to be able to do that by, for example, providing services under alternative scenarios, being able to temporarily exceed caps, exceed service limitations, find ways to pay retainers and so forth. And today our interim director at the Department of, uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Division of Development of Disabilities, our interim director there, Tony Green is gonna come up and talk to a little bit how that's impacting how we're providing services for our folks in developmental disabilities. So Tony, if I could ask you to come up and uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing different here in the state to provide those services. Thank you, Governor. Um, as Governor said, my name is Tony Green. I'm the interim director for the Division of Developmental Disabilities, um, which is a part of our larger health and human service system. Uh, to kind of start off uh, talking about our larger mission at HHS is always uh, we're committed to helping Nebraskans live better lives. And right now that means caring for all Nebraskans, uh, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. And so one of the things to ensure that our uh, DHHS CEO, Danette Smith, as well as our chief uh, medical officer, Dr. Gary Antone, encourage all healthcare providers to follow the guidance of the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, including their obligation under laws and regulations that would prohibit the discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, disability, age, or sex. So wanted to kind of start off that of how that kind of plays into what we do at HHS in supporting folks with developmental disabilities. Largely what I'll talk about briefly uh, is the Appendix K. Um, in developmental disabilities, we operate two home and community-based waivers for folks that qualify to live in intermediate care facilities, such as the Beatrice State Development Center. They choose not to live there and they choose to get their services in the community, hence the waiver um, for eligibility. We serve just under 5,000 participants across the entire state under those two waivers. The Appendix K that you'll hear us refer to is really, uh, it's a standalone appendix to our waivers that uh, at the federal level, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services allow us to submit that as a plan to provide services to folks in alternative manners during an emergency situation. So we submitted that plan to CMS on March 31st uh, and received final approval of that plan on April 20th. That plan does run uh, retroactively to March 6th uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and currently has an end date of September 6th, 2020, um, with an earlier end date if the emergency is lifted and, and an earlier end date is requested. So specifically to the governor's point, what it allows us to do is deliver the services and supports that we deliver to folks across the state in alternative ways. Some of those uh, alternative methods would be uh, folks that receive um, services in alternate settings. Um, it would allow folks to also um, have retainer payments for services, more for our providers when services, uh, the participant's not able to uh, attend services. It allows us to uh, remove caps on certain services, and I'll talk about some of these in detail. It also allows us to deliver some of our services when appropriate in electronic uh, methods. Um, and it allows then some of the person-centered planning uh, that our service coordinators at the state level are required to do uh, some flexibility with timelines of when we have to comply with those, those plans. And then there also is an increase uh, in certain services for the provider payment rates. So some examples of services being delivered in, in alternate settings. Uh, Folks that receive some of our residential services, or folks will call them sometimes group home or congregate care, uh, where they receive 24-hour care, 
Um, it allows those participants to receive those services in other settings if needed. So if a participant per perhaps was uh, recommended to be quarantined or isolated, we can still deliver those services in a different setting that they perhaps don't normally live in, like, like a family home or an another setting. Um, it also allows our day services. So during the day when some of our participants attend providers' vocational sites, um, obviously right now we're not having folks go out and attend day programs, and so they're staying in their residence, whether that's in their, their group uh, congregate care or it's in their own apartments or with their family. The flexibility that's allowed under this Appendix K is to still support them during the day and provide staffing from DD agencies, but it will be delivered in their home as opposed to in a day service site. Where, where they normally would receive those services. Uh, those are some of the, the flexibilities of, of how those services would look. Um, there are a couple services that don't have flexibilities in them, and those would be employment services. And so some of our folks who are employed uh, and receive job coaching, unfortunately, like many, uh, those folks uh, are not working right now uh, in, in many capacities, and so they're able to pick a different day service to cover their day uh, for supports if they need that. Um, some of the other changes for the, the service coordinators, uh, as far as that planning that CMS has allowed, is some of the requirements we have for an annual level of care which is the requirement to be on our waivers. There's flexibility with the timelines that we have some extensions to do those beyond the annual 12-month time period. Um, there's also flexibility that when a participant needs to immediately change their service array uh, to a different service um, or increase hours, that the plan that's required to document that in can be done 60 days after the change. Normally, we have to do that right away uh, immediately when the change occurs, but there's been some flexibility uh, for the paperwork, if you will, that the, that the service coordinators across the state um, have to complete for that. <coughs> um, payment rates, again, temporarily, there are uh, some of the services within our waiver do allow for an increased uh, payment. In our continuous res, host home, shared living, and independent and supported family living services. And really what this is to do is to account for the excess overtime that our, our providers out in the community are having to provide as well as the increased cost that they're incurring uh, for supplies and, and other materials to deliver services in alternate ways. Uh, the, the tele-monitoring or the electronic method of service delivery, the other uh, flexibility that's allowed, so when appropriate, uh, again, folks aren't coming to their normal day sites during the day, and there are individuals that could benefit still from some habilitation or interaction with their staff, but more in a remote manner. Um, and this uh, flexibility under the Appendix K allows those services, when appropriate, to be delivered uh, in an electronic method to the, to the participants. So that is really what the, the, a high level of what those flexibilities are. I would encourage folks, if you would like details of the Appendix K, uh, there are frequently asked questions also posted on our DHHS uh, website uh, that you could go to and, and get some additional details. But you can, you can see that what we're trying to do within developmental disabilities is to, again, help uh, guide some of the, the rules of folks staying home and, and not... Uh, going into their normal day programs and providers. I will uh, thank all of our agency and our independent providers who have done an exceptional job of delivering services to the 5,000 folks across the state who have developmental disabilities. Our provider association, the Nebraska Association of Service Providers, has been instrumental in uh, helping us craft and develop the uh, Appendix K. And then I would be remiss if I also didn't mention our own staff service coordination as well as those staff uh, supporting our folks at the Beatrice State Development Center doing a phenomenal job uh, meeting everyone's needs during this pandemic. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tony, for all the work that you and your team are doing to serve our citizens with developmental disabilities and especially under these trying times of this pandemic emergency. Okay, next we want to just hit upon uh, PPE requests. So one of the things the state has been doing, and I covered this a little bit earlier uh, this week and so forth with regard to how the state has been going out and acquiring personal protective equipment to be able to provide our, our, our health care workers, our 
first responders and so forth. There has been some question as we are going to open up elective surgery statewide starting May 4th with regard to dentist offices and so forth with regard to being able to get PPE from the state. I think the first thing that everybody should be looking to do is try and acquire your own PPE, all right? Okay, so that should be the first line that you're pursuing is to get your own PPE. However, we do at the state have PPE that we are distributing to folks, but I wanted to go over what the priorities on those were so that people would understand uh, where they fall in line with regard to that. So before I get into that, though, everybody's got to work with their local public health department. So what we do is for people who want to get PPE from the state, you have to contact your local public health department. They then contact the state. We distribute it back to the public health department, and they distribute it out to the folks in their community, uh, those organizations based upon their priority. And the priority is uh, first for groups that provide direct care to people with coronavirus, right? So we're talking about hospitals, doctors, clinics. We're talking about emergency transport, EMS, law enforcement, firefighters. Uh, we're talking about long-term care facilities and home health, and then coroners. And then second, groups in essential workforce, uh, that are essential workforce, things such as corrections, utility workers, public health staff, those are the second group that then get PPE. Then we go to next to other medical groups. And so this would be social services, behavioral health services, pharmacy, dentists, um, uh, elective surgery, optometry. So again, those would be kind of the third priority down in front of, uh, behind those other groups. And then finally, other groups would include uh, child care, grocery stores, and so forth. So you can see kind of the, the order there that we're prioritizing how we distribute PPE. So I hope that helps clean, clear up. Again, what you have to do is work with your local public health department, though, with regard to that to be able to get access to that PPE. And then uh, finally, scheduled for this week, English briefings at 2 o'clock Central Time. Uh, we have a Spanish briefing uh, tomorrow night at 5 p.m. So our 5 p.m. Central Time, Spanish briefing, Spanish language. Also tomorrow night will be the Speaking of Nebraska on NET at 830 to 930. And then, as always, we're going to go ahead and get into questions that have been submitted to us and then get to the questions in the room. So Christian Wagger, NTV. While many families are getting assistance from unemployment, what about families who are still working but getting significantly less money slash hours? Uh, they don't qualify for benefits but are not able to make, end meet, um, make ends meet only working once or twice a week. Is there any help or plans for helping them? So a couple things. First of all, uh, what I would say is those folks should work with their employers about getting a short-term compensation plan put in place at that place of employment. So what the short-term compensation plan does is it allows employers to um, only have people work maybe between 10 and 60% of what they were going to work otherwise. So you could maybe be working, for example, half time, and then you could be collecting unemployment benefits the other half time. But the employers have to enroll in that program, short-time compensation program, contact the Department of Labor. That's how that would work. So that would be one alternative. And then, of course, we've got community collaboratives that are all across the state to be able to help families who are having troubles make ends meet. So uh, that's another area to connect with your local community collaborative. Mona Weatherly from the Custer County Chief. The governor has asked Nebraskans to file guidelines for Memorial Day celebrations and events, uh, limiting gatherings to 10 people, social distancing, et cetera. Good job, Mona. I'm glad you picked up on that. Uh, what recommendations or suggestions are there for Legion posts and auxiliary units that host Memorial Day uh, ceremonies? So our Department of Veterans Affairs is going to be making an announcement uh, with regard to a virtual Memorial Day celebration, and I encourage then all those Legion posts to participate in that virtually with regard to what we're going to do. So I'd say stay tuned. We will make an announcement on that uh, next week with regard to that. But uh, again, uh, do our virtual Memorial Day celebration. What are the governor's thoughts on uh, town celebrations, parades, alumni gatherings, and county fairs? Many communities may already be in the planning stages or need to be in the planning stages. What recommendations or suggestions are there for these communities at this time? So reminder, through May, we're going to be the 10-person rule. We're doing that and following along what's going to happen with regard to our health care system. If our health care system stays stable, then we will be looking at taking other steps to loosen up those restrictions. So you can imagine that a 10-person rule may go up to something higher. However, depending on how many people you think you're going to have and the timing of your event, you can certainly count on some sort of restrictions 
that are going to be in place when you have your event. So we're looking at, uh, again, parades. Uh, you know, for example, if you have a parade where everybody stays in their cars and everybody watches from their homes and doesn't, you know, there's no social interaction there, you could probably structure something like that pretty easily. Uh, with regard to, I know people are going to want some guidance on county fairs and so forth. I would say alumni gatherings probably shouldn't be trying to be held unless you've got a very small graduating class. Uh, and especially if you've got older alumni, do not invite them. Again, if you're somebody who's older with those underlying health care conditions, you need to continue to stay away from those big groups. So um, especially with the older class reunions, do not have those class reunions. Uh, town celebrations, same deal. You're probably not going to be able to have those. Uh, the way you've had those in the past, so think about ways to do those virtually. I know that, uh, for example, for high school graduations, folks are looking for ways to recognize by leaving the lights on at football fields and so forth. So that might be some alternatives. But again, you can expect that as we're going into June, we're still going to be under some pretty small restrictions as far as size of crowds gathering. So a lot of those activities really just won't be possible. So uh, we'll obviously put out guidance on that, but we're going to you know, want to see what happens as we go through May to be able to make those decisions, so we're not going to have anything specifically with regard to June until we get well into May. Chris Stoom, NTV. It's been a while since you announced dorms would be open for COVID at UNK. Are they ready to take in patients? Yes. Uh, yep. Hey, we're working on that, so absolutely. Uh, so yes, they're actually in place and ready to go. We do not have anybody staying in the dorms there currently, but uh, yes, they are ready to go. Daniel uh, Berman, Enterprise Media Group, is there any indication about what restrictions that DHM would have in place and why a new DHM would be issued for a district to include, oh, include Washington County. Uh, Washington County has few cases. Uh, so again, I think we just made that announcement with regard to the Three Rivers Public Health Department. That includes Washington County. Uh, they will be going under the less restrictive guidelines starting May 11th. Rob McCartney. Some federal stimulus dollars are now getting to area universities and colleges. The University of Nebraska has already announced free tuition for students from families making less than 60,000 years. What else can, should the state do to help higher education students? And again, I would certainly uh, be, you know, working with the University of Nebraska with regard to those things. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that we can do at the state is continue to follow our plan with regard to slowing the spread of virus here in Nebraska focusing on making sure we preserve our health care system. I think that's the best thing we can do for uh, those uh, students. Uh, Delon Dillard, KETV. We're hearing from doctors that Nebraska is still a few weeks away from uh, peak cases. Doctors also warn of a potential second wave of cases. Do you think it is responsible to ease restrictions when we are still expecting vast number of more cases to come? When do you expect Nebraska to hit its peak? So let's take a step back again, folks. A couple months ago, when we were all talking about what to do with regard to this pandemic, all of our public health experts said you cannot change the area under the curve. That means you cannot change the number of people getting infected. All you can do, well, we don't have a curve here, but is, is you can flatten the curve, which means you spread it out. Same number of people are going to get infected because it's a virus. We can't stop it from coming. But you reduce the peak so that you don't overwhelm the healthcare system, that you make sure that everybody who needs that hospital bed, that ventilator, can get access to it. That's what we were all told to plan around a couple of months ago. And that's what we've done. We put restrictions in place that have accomplished that. We've been very successful here in Nebraska with regard to flattening that curve. We have not even come close to overwhelming our healthcare system. In the places where we have hotspots, places like Grand Island, we have worked with the local healthcare providers like CHI St. Francis to be able to move patients to where we do have capacity to make sure that we can continue to serve people. And we've been very successful in that. In fact, uh, my recollection is, uh, Dr. Antone, that they, uh, right now CHI St. Francis only has 10 patients on ventilators, which is down from where they were for the past couple of weeks. And I'm sorry, 10 patients in the ICU and seven on ventilators, is my recollection. Six, Six now on ventilators. So again, the numbers even there are declining. So even our, in our place where we have the most cases, we have seen that we've been able to manage the healthcare system. And if you look in places like Omaha, where we've got, uh, I think we've got, oh, I should have remembered those numbers better, but it was like 346 ventilators, 106 were in use, um, 20 or so. You get the numbers there, Dr. Anto? Are you looking at the numbers? Am I trying to make this up and you got the numbers? No, I mean, you have such a good memory. I mean, um, I can't believe you don't remember. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Do you have the there are 76% of the ventilators in Omaha available. 76% of the ventilators in Omaha are available right now. 
So, and that's our largest metropolitan area. So if you look at our largest metropolitan area and you look at what we've got with regard to um, uh, Grand Island where we've got the most number of cases, the healthcare system is well in hand. And so that's why we have the confidence to be able to start loosening some of these restrictions. Again, it gets back to that analogy I used. Uh, we could end all fatalities, or almost all of them, on the interstate if we took the speed limit down to five miles an hour. But we don't do that. We have, in a sense, done that with everything we've done with these restrictions for regard to coronavirus. We've really slowed things down with the restrictions we put in place, and it's worked. We, we've, we've pushed that curve down, we spread it out, we have not overwhelmed the healthcare system, and now what we're trying to do is loosen these restrictions gradually over time to figure out well, what is that right speed limit? Where can we take this up to? Where we, do we have that capacity? And so that's what we're doing right now as we start to loosen these restrictions. So again, the thing we were told to manage to two months ago, we have managed to it, and we've managed to it very successfully. And that's what we're going to continue to do. So with that, uh, Taylor, do you have other questions that came in? So Kevin, WWTV wants to know if there's an explanation for the sharp drop in new cases yesterday. And yes, Kevin, uh, that there, is, there was a data error in that. So the data out there is not accurate. So anybody looking at the data from yesterday, uh, that data is not accurate. What happened was is we sent a bunch of records from the public health lab. It's, it kind of bogged down the system. We've taken steps to make sure that doesn't happen again. But because the system got bogged down, not all the cases got reported. So what our plan is by 5 o'clock tonight, or 545 rather, between 545 and 6, we should have new updated information that should accurately reflect what happened yesterday plus today. So we should get back on track by about 6 o'clock tonight. He also asked, uh, when will Test for Oscar reach the 3,000 test per day goal? And so the question uh, he also asked is, when will we reach the 3,000 test per day goal? Again, when I announced this, we said it would take us about five weeks to be able to get that up and running. So uh, get to our maximum, I should say. So we're working on getting the lab set up right now. We're uh, still planning to be able to start rolling out testing in Omaha and Grand Island. So again, for folks in those communities, sign up at testnebraska.com. Uh, great opportunity to be able to go out and do that. So get signed up so that you can start getting in line for the testing. Grand Island and Omaha will be first when we start getting it rolling, but it is going to take several weeks to get all the teams signed up uh, to be able to get to that maximum of 3,000. Julie Cornell from KTV says Nebraska medicine has seen a spike in cases. Do you think that has anything to do with people not following social, social distancing at Easter, which was about two weeks ago? Julie Cornell says uh, UNMC, has seen a spike, the UNMC has seen a spike in cases. Is that related to people not following social distancing at Easter? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I certainly can't give you any scientific evidence, and uh, nobody from UNMC or anybody else in our public health divisions has said specifically that uh, Easter celebrations were responsible for any sort of uptick in the number of coronavirus cases. We've had some anecdotal evidence and so forth, and uh, we do know that we can trace specific outbreaks to, uh, for example, somebody who uh, was in one city and went to Grand Island and came back and, and did infect other people. Uh, we know also there was a party that was going on, that the person was showing symptoms, and she ended up having the party anyway, and so other people got infected. So this is, again, why when we're talking about Cinco de Mayo or Memorial Day celebrations, please, if you limit to your household, that's going to be the best thing to do. That's going to be the safest thing to do. Uh, no more than 10 people at the most. And if you are symptomatic, do not have a party. Do not go anywhere. Right? If you've got that fever, that cough, that shortness of breath, uh, anything that, you know, go on the CDC website, you can see what their guidelines are, but do not go out, stay home and quarantine yourself so that you do not infect other people. That is so important that when you start showing those symptoms, you absolutely stay home. Aaron Duffy from the World Herald uh, wants to know if you've asked meat processors to institute any particular measures on your uh, calls with them. Have you talked to meat packer workers directly? So uh, Aaron Duffy is wanting to know if we've asked uh, food processors and meat processors to do anything specifically. Actually, this is why we have uh, actually UNMC and their Global Health Center, uh, and I want to thank uh, Shelly Sweetholm and her team for this. They put out their uh, meat processing facility COVID-19 playbook. It's out there on their website so everybody can see it. And that has been distributed to other states like Iowa and Missouri. And this is what, and actually, frankly, it probably goes a little bit beyond what the CDC guidelines that came out, uh, I think yesterday or the day before were. 
Uh, this is what we're uh, showing to all of our food processors here in the state as best practices, and this is the kind of thing that we're asking them to do. So yes, so we are making those specific requests of food processors saying, hey, these are industry's uh, best standards. Um, I've talked, not only do we do that on my weekly call with the food processors, where we go over this, the, the playbook and talk about those things. Shelly goes out and visits facilities. I think she's actually she's doing site visits today. She's also, so I think that'll bring it up to maybe nine facilities she's been to, uh, nine or 11. Uh, she's, so she's been out visiting facilities. I've had personal conversations with some of the facilities, asking them to, uh, you know, again, make sure that they're following the guidelines and so forth. So we are absolutely doing that. And the second part of the question was, have I talked to workers? Uh, we get the feedback from workers. I uh, have talked to Eric Reeder, who is the UFCW president, uh, local 293. And so he's given me some feedback on what he sees as best practices and what he'd like to see the food processors doing. And we also get that feedback back through our local public health departments and the kind of feedback they're hearing from uh, workers directly or for, from the um, uh, health clinics and so forth. So the question was from Liliana, uh, the state's goal is to get through um, our 75% of our unemployment applications between 21 and 28 days, and we do not have Commissioner Albin here, so I cannot tell you how close we are to meeting that goal. I can tell you on Monday we processed about $40 million worth of the pandemic unemployment assistance program. And just to, I want to just, again, put this all in perspective. Since beginning of March, so in roughly two months, we have received as many applications as we had in the previous two years combined. So over the last two months, we've received as many applications into the Department of Labor as the previous two years. That just gives you an idea of the type of volume that we are receiving in. So we're, we are working to be able to process those applications. We've uh, hired outside firms to be able to help us with that. One of the, some of the feedback we got back from the outside firms when they started doing this work for us as adjudicators, they said, oh, this is more complicated than we thought. So we've gone from about 34 people processing these applications as adjudicators up to 166 people processing these as adjudicators. So again, we're working to be able to get through these as quickly as possible, and uh, we'll have to get back specifically with regard to where we are with regard to that 75% goal. So Rob McCartney's question is, why can't you update your profile and why can't you uh, list other sorts of conditions when you check the other box? Uh, with regard to that, again, we were trying to make something that was relatively streamlined and get it up so that people could start doing the assessment and get registered for the testing. We will allow people to go back and uh, adjust that uh, through a process of updating their profile as we get closer to doing the testing and so forth. So that will be coming. So. Stay tuned on that one. And then with regard to the other box, again, we're just trying to streamline it and make it as efficient as possible so that people didn't have to spend a ton of time on that. But again, if you've got underlying conditions, you'll be able to, um, you know, certainly be able to inform somebody about that as you're taking the test or your doctor or something when you get that test result back. But really kind of focus on the things that were going to be the highest priority with regard to that, trying to keep it streamlined so it can make it user friendly. So the question was, are we, uh, are we just going to test the general population? So our plans will be, when we start doing testing, we'll certainly focus on the people who protect us, those healthcare workers, first responders, then highly symptomatic people, then uh, less symptomatic people, and then asymptomatic people as we have capacity. So to the, the point about getting to the asymptomatic people, we will get there, but we're going to prioritize those other folks first. So Bill Shammer wants to know how companies are handling HIPAA with regard to um, the uh, with regard to people being sick, 
a uh, report of a woman who claims that her husband got sick after working next to somebody who was also uh, tested positive and sick, but the company didn't tell the worker supposedly that the person was sick or whatever. Actually, the way that process is supposed to work is through our public health departments and our contact tracing. So that is how, when somebody gets identified as uh, being COVID positive or coronavirus positive, then what we do, working together from the state, we were supplying additional resources to the counties and their public health departments to be able to do that contact tracing. So that's how that process is supposed to work. I can't speak for the specific case, but that's how that would work is really being, uh, you know, working to be able to identify who was working next to that person, but also in contact and social situations and all those sort of things. That's what the goal of our contact tracing would be. But again, we're relying on the person who was identified with coronavirus to tell our public health departments about that. Right? So this is not the company's responsibility necessarily. This is what the person's got to let us know who they've been in contact with. Don wants to know if you believe the acting workers are being adequately protected even if they can't be six feet of physical distancing. So Don Walton wants to know are uh, workers being adequately protected in our meat processing facilities even if they can't be you know, six feet apart. Again, what we want people to do is socially distance where possible that six feet. I've given lots of examples where that may not be necessary. Some of our, again, our, some of our new DHMs are going to allow, for example, for salon workers to work if both the hairstylist and the, the customer is being masked. And so with regard to our meat processing facilities, I will tell you that uh, our processors are taking a number of steps to be able to do uh, social distancing and also not only spreading people out, but putting up barriers. So for example, putting up barriers between workstations, putting up plastic barriers at the lunchroom so everybody eats by themselves, taking temperatures of people who are coming in. Um, I know that Shelly Sweethelm has done a number of tours and advised them on additional steps they can take with regard to asking more questions about people being symptomatic or addressing their air handling conditions or doing more hand sanitizing stations and so forth. So it's a very difficult environment to be able to socially distance but I, all of our meat processors are working diligently to make sure they take care of their folks and, and do the best they can in a very difficult environment to do that social distancing and put up those barriers. And then the other thing we gotta remember too is this also has to happen at home too, and we've talked a lot about that, where a lot of these communities that are working in the, facility, in the meat processing facilities, English is not their first language, so we've got a language barrier we've got to overcome. Um, there's a, sometimes a distrust for government, so sometimes they're not, uh, paying attention to what we're doing in state government or our local public health departments. Um, a lot of their living conditions are much more densely uh, you know, packed than maybe somebody else's house. So we got more people living in a household. That makes it difficult to the socially um, distance. And then uh, we're working to address each of those issues to be able to do a better job communicating, to reach out to local community leaders, to be able to help be that friendly face that can talk about contact tracing or testing or any of the number of things with regard to um, you know, working at home to do a better job of social distancing. And then we're also working on helping those families find ways that they can isolate by, uh, you know, moving people into a dorm room or a, a, hospital or a hotel room or so forth. So we're taking steps to address all those things. So there's a lot we're doing to be able to protect the health and safety of those workers to be able to mitigate what is a very difficult situation both at work and at home to be able to socially distance. Will there be testing So the question was, will there be testing this weekend in South Omaha where we have packing plants? Um, Omaha is doing continued testing, so not just around the uh, meat processors, but just in general with regard to the Omaha community. So there will be continued ongoing testing. Charlie Johnson from the Journal Star would like to know uh, if you consulted with Mayor Taylor Baird as well as Health Director Lopez about their DHM and what input you incorporated into your new uh, directive. So I'm sorry. So who? Was it Riley? Riley Johnson. Riley Johnson from the Journal Star wants to know if we consulted with uh, Mayor uh, Gaylor Baird and Pat Lopez, the local public health director uh, here in Lincoln, with regards to their DHM. And the answer is yes, we did. And we, uh, Pat provided us uh, feedback, for example, on things such as the restaurant openings. And uh, some of that was incorporated into the guidelines or the guidance document was put out. I know that Pat also worked, for example, with Zoe Olson, who we had here yesterday, or yeah, it was yesterday, right, talking about the restaurant guidelines and so forth. So yes, it was a collaborative process. Finally, Michael from the Dakota County Star would like to know if summer sports teams like baseball and softball will have the opportunity to play this 
summer and says it seems like these sports are socially distant? Uh, Michael from the Dakota County Star wants to know if they will be able to play baseball and softball this summer. Uh, and so, again, that gets back to what I was talking about before, some of these other activities. So it was certainly not in May, okay, because we've got the 10-person rule, and that it's going to be difficult for anybody to play a game in baseball or softball with only 10 people, though as kids, you know, you can kind of do that stuff. But uh, not right now, so not this month. As we get into June and we look at loosening some of these restrictions, I could envision we maybe get to a point where you can maybe do practices, but that's not a promise, that's a speculation, and it depends on what happens in May here with regard to us loosening up our guidelines. So if our health system stays stable, we will be loosening up guidelines further, and we may be able to get to the point that people may be able to do some practicing in June, and could you see that maybe ending up in being games this latter half of July? That's potential, but I would say that if you're thinking about pulling your team together and you're gonna do practices in May, that's not gonna happen. And maybe you'll be able to do it in June, but certainly I would not count on having any games played in June. Maybe, but don't count on it. Is that it, Taylor? That's all I got from you. Okay, great. Fred. Thank you very much, Fred. I appreciate, I appreciate that question because I forgot to mention that detail. Uh, yes, the new DHMs for the three public health districts I just mentioned will be on lines with what Douglas, Sarpy, and, and Cass County have. So same sort of uh, relaxation of the restrictions on restaurants having dine-in capacity up to 50% of the rated occupancy, um, salons being able to open but with masks for customers and um, stylists and so forth. Paul. Well, I would say generally Nebraska's doing a great job. I would say that actually based upon, and I, uh, we got traffic data back from, uh, that I was gonna talk about today too, and I forgot to. The traffic data actually for last week is not as good. So we've been doing a really good job uh, for the first few weeks of that. Last week, the traffic data was only a 23% de decrease from our baseline versus the 28% we were the week before. Uh, Omaha and Lincoln were at uh, minus 27% from the baseline versus minus 32 and 35 percent. So we've actually kind of dropped off a little bit. So come on, Nebraskans, we need to kind of step it up here, uh, continue to stay home. Maybe people are anticipating the end of the month coming along or something like that. But in general, if you look at what's happened with regard to um, our social distancing and things like that, it has resulted in the goal that we wanted, which is to preserve the healthcare system. So we're still at you know big capacities with regard to hospital beds and ventilators and so forth. So the question is, with better weather, are people going to say, hey, it's time to get out? And look, folks, I think everybody's tired of, of doing this, but we've got to continue to do social distancing. We're going to be doing this all through the summer and fall in some form or other. So as you decide to get out and enjoy the nice weather, which we want people to do, please remember the social distancing guidelines, the 10-person rule on gatherings, best if you're only within your own household, and then certainly as you're out, stay six feet away from other people. So... Again, we want people to practice, continue to practice these good social guidelines, and we're going to be at that 10-person rule through the month of May. And a couple questions about the test in Nebraska. Uh, you said now the state is up to 1,000 to 1,200 tests a day. Right. How is that possible? What's happened? I think we're at 600, 800 a week ago. So the, the question was, we were about 600, 800 a week ago. I think it was probably just a little bit longer ago than that, but not long ago. Yeah. And now we're up to 1,000 to 1,200 tests a day. How is that possible? Well, first of all, the folks at the public health lab are really busting their tails to be able to turn around tests and get them out. So I want to compliment the team. You know, we talked about kind of some of the, the limitations on reagents and so forth and just the machines and how much time they can do. They have done a fantastic job of stretching that and making it work. So we said that with some of the pooling, we might be able to get to 400 tests a day, and they've been able to do that. They've delivered on that. So the pu folks at the public health lab have really done a, a great job, and I want to thank P. Iwin and all the folks there. They've done fantastic. Also, what we're seeing is, as the commercial labs have been able to step up, we've been able to get more tests back from the commercial labs, like LabCorp and Quest. We've also seen hospital systems around the state develop their own tests and be able to ramp that up. So, for example, CHI has been able to do that. Um, of course, UNMC is a partner in, with uh, their machines to be able to do more testing. So I think what you're seeing is just a collaboration of everybody 
finding ways to continue to improve upon what they're doing to be able to process more of these tests. And we're going to continue to focus on that as well. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we received uh, you know, the, the list from the federal government of all the machines that could possibly do this type of testing. And we're reaching out to them to be able to find out what are the obstacles for them doing that. Now, these are not most, uh, by and large, they're not high throughput machines. But if we can get reagents for them and, and work with those facilities, we can expand testing that way as well. So we're continuing to look for ways we can expand testing. The Test Nebraska is one of those ways, but we're not leaving it just that. We're looking for other ways, too. And again, like I said, the team at Public Health Lab has really done a fantastic job. And it's been just over a week since you urged people to sign up. Uh, looks like we're only about 4,000 new ones from yesterday. Are you encouraged or discouraged by the sign-up rate? Uh, look, I think 104,000 people is a great start. But folks, we're still behind Iowa. We've got to catch up here. So do that hashtag Test Nebraska Challenge. Go sign up. Get, get it out to five of your friends. Use the viral power of social media to be able to fight this virus so that we can get more people signed up. This is, again, how we are going to look at allocating our testing resources. So if you want testing in your community, get people in your community to sign up for testnebraska.com. But, but you haven't mentioned where we've the bio, but we're our... I, Off the top of my head, I don't know how far, uh, where Iowa was, but I know Iowa was like at 80,000 like a couple of days in when they announced. Um, and we were like at 50,000. So I know we had some catching up to do. Yeah, the please. The announcement from Executive Order from President Trump in regards to the meatpacking plants and facilities today, do you have any comment about the reassurance towards your plan or what that does also for the state of Nebraska? Well, certainly I appreciate President Trump issuing that executive order, really reinforcing how important this industry is to be able to supplying our food in the country and our state. So it's important, mission critical, that we keep this open, and that's what the president recognized. But we also have to do all the things we're doing, right? So we have to continue to focus in those communities where we have food processors. We've got to work on the testing. So we're doing, for example, in Dakota County right now, we're doing a lot of testing. The National Guard is assisting with that. Then we've got to do the contact tracing. This is part of what we're doing with regard to expanding our contact tracing teams. So we expect by the end of next week, we'll have that first group of 325, those first 10 teams all up and trained and assisting our public health departments in doing that contact tracing. Um, we'll have four of those teams will be up and running this week to be able to help do that contact tracing and assisting our public health departments, specifically in these areas where we have a lot of cases and in the communities where we've got the, that food processing. Uh, we also have to continue to work with the plants on the things they're doing. We talked about earlier with regard to social distancing, the steps are day, they're doing to be able to put up barriers between workstations, taking temperatures of people coming in, looking at how they can change the layout, their air handling conditions, lunch rooms, all those places, you know, breaking up those places where people can congregate. So we've got to work with our, our food processing facilities on that. And that's what our, uh, you know, the UNMC's Global Health Center has put out with their, their playbook to be able to help establish those best practices. And then we've got to reach out into the community to get that social distancing at home. So that's what we're all talking about when we're talking about reaching out to health clinics and other local community leaders to help us with the education on social distancing, the contact tracing, the testing, all that sort of thing, you know, doing... Um, all that communication in languages that are reaching those communities like Spanish or Somali or whatever it's going to be, those kind of things, those are all the sorts of things we have to do to be able to address this from a community standpoint to be able to actually put into practice that executive order of keeping these facilities open. That's what this is all about is all these things are necessary to be able to do that social distancing to keep these facilities open. And that's what we're working very hard to do. Well, again, so this is similar to what we saw with, like, toilet paper, right? <laughs> go in and buy what you need for the week. Uh, you know, a couple months ago, we told everybody to go out, get two weeks worth of food. They should still have that, right? So go out, shop once a week, buy what you need for the week. We're going to keep the supply lines open. You may not have all the selection you had in the past. But, again, this is why we're working so hard to keep these facilities open. You know, we're working very hard to make sure these food processors stay open so that we can continue to supply the food to those tables in Nebraska and across the, across the country. So shop what you need, shop once a week, don't take the family, 
Take just what, get, just shop what you need for that week, and we'll continue to work on keeping these open so that food supply chain is there. Well, we are working with the employers to put all these social distancing steps in place. And, and frankly, the people who work there also have to worry about social distancing at home. In fact, they're probably more likely to get pick up an infection outside the workplace where they spend two-thirds of their time than they are inside the workplace with all the changes that are being made. In fact, I th uh, in talking to some folks, there's a, a looking at cell phone day, there's a potential that maybe where most people are getting it is at the grocery store. So again, that's why we tell people don't take the family shop once a week, you know, do it quickly and so forth. So uh, we want to we want to make sure that we're looking at, and that we're looking at all aspects of life to be able to do that social distancing. Work is one aspect of that, and we're working directly with those food processors on that. But that's it, but you're exactly right. It is a balance between what we're doing right now with regard to um, protecting the health of the workers and maintaining the food supply chain. We've got to do all of that, and we've got to look at it in a global picture here with regard to the entire community and every aspect of what we're doing. And we know, for example, as I mentioned, a, a lot of the workers come from places where their households are socially different to socially difficult because they've got a number of people in multiple generations. We're working to address that through things like our hotels and dorm rooms. We're working to do outreach through different languages. But and we're working with the meat processors on their facilities. So it's really got to be everything's got to come together to be able to make this work. So the question was, if you are self-employed, say in a salon, and you decline to re, uh, you decline to reopen, are you going to lose your benefits? And the answer to that would be no, because if again, we, what we've directed the Department of Labor to do is be very expansive. That if you are one of those self-employed people and you choose not to open up your uh, shop, and it has to be, but it has to be coronavirus related. So it does have to be related back to the coronavirus. But if it is related back to the coronavirus and you choose not to open up again, you will not lose not lose those benefits if you're self-employed. So the question was, does the President's order raise the profile of those folks to get PPE or live in dorms and so forth? Uh, you know, certainly we were already working to be able to make sure that the, the plants were staying open and providing the dormitories and so forth. Uh, we're looking for, to help those families be able to get, for example, into the dormitories and so forth. And, uh, you know, again, we're encouraging the companies to work with regard to getting their PPE because, again, we're still going to have the priorities that I mentioned before with regard to healthcare workers and so forth. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, potentially, you know, that it, I, I suppose it would help, you know, potentially it would be something, but we've still got higher priorities with regard to healthcare workers and people who are directly taking care of coronavirus patients. So we're encouraging the food processors to reach out and get their own protective equipment. Uh, I, do, I, don't, I know we've got a few people in Omaha that are taking advantage of the dorm rooms right now, but I don't know specifically if they're working at meat food processing plants. Have you considered going to one of these food processing plants just to reassure people and see for yourself? So the question is, have I considered going to one of the food processing plants and seeing it for myself? Again, I'm taking my own advice, what we've been talking about with our Stay Home to Stay Healthy, which is I go between my house and the Capitol back to my house. <laughs> so I've been doing, I've not been taking unnecessary trips outside of the high school because I've been trying to live up to what I've been telling everybody else. In fact, the only trip I take outside of that is on Saturday, I go pick up pizza to bring back for lunch and that's, I stay home all weekend long for just that reason. So no, I haven't been to any of these facilities. We have discussed it, but we've decided that on balance, it's better to continue to follow the rules that we're telling everybody else to follow. Home in Omaha. Or across the street. Home in Omaha. Yeah. Anybody So the question was, what about bowling alleys? Bowling alleys were never prohibited from being open, right? So they were never closed 
specifically, they have to follow the same rules as everybody else, though. They gotta have 10-person rule, which means no more than 10 customers in their bowling alley at any one time, social distancing six feet apart, you know, that kind of thing. So, but bowling alleys can be open with those guidelines. Yeah. Oh, 40 million was all overall we paid out. Okay, um, sorry, money. So I'm sorry. So the PUA was only was six million of a, out of 11, 6.8 million, and how much? 11,000. 11,000 claims. Thank you, Taylor, for uh, that correction. A couple, couple more questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, mentioning the, the priority for PPE, for example, some are on the same area that we get PPE. Um, would you recommend they stay closed because of that fact that they can't get it? Well, both the customer and the hairstylist will need to be masked. That's in the DHM. It is a misdemeanor to violate that. So if you cannot meet those, then yes, you should not open. So the question is the state supplying uh, cleaning products to businesses are reopening. Again, the, the hand sanitizer and so forth that we are providing is in the priority I mentioned earlier. So businesses are at the bottom of that list. It's up to the local public health department to make that determination. But when we distribute out that hand sanitizer, its priority is to go to healthcare workers, first responders, that kind of thing first. One more question? Paul. Paul says he notices that the public tours of the Capitol are not closed. Did I have any role in that decision? I did not. I was not a part of that decision. So, Capitol Commission. Capital Commission uh, yeah, I think that might have been a call just by uh, Bob Ripley specifically. But I don't even know the answer to that, so don't take that as gospel because, uh, again, I, I have not talked to Bob, so I don't know that he did do that. All right, folks. Again, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Again, we will continue to have these briefings, 2 o'clock Central Time, the rest of the week. Tomorrow night, 5 p.m., we'll have the Spanish la uh, language briefing on NET tomorrow night, 8.30 to 9.30 on Speaking of Nebraska. Thank you all very much, and thank you to all the Nebraskans who are working to slow the spread of coronavirus here in our state. Please, based on the traffic data I said, we still needed uh, this past week, we kind of let it slip a little bit, so everybody needs to kind of get back on the ball with regard to staying home, staying healthy, staying connected, following our rules with regard to staying home so that we can slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. Thanks very much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. you.